This is not a spoiler-free discussion. In fact, it is the exact opposite. This video is a continuation of a series of discussions about Remake and its place in the compilation. But this particular video is going to break away from the familiar and focus on some elements that are connected to Remake directly, but not through the compilation. Today, we're going to be going into something new, something different, but it will be all too familiar to you guys the relevance that this material has. Stories and myths have long since been adopted in the storytelling of Final Fantasy games. Unlike other games, Remake makes direct associations to key aspects of these stories and mythologies, almost unapologetically so, and that these events in the stories and mythologies oddly mirror information that we have gathered up until this point through this series of videos. So while you might not see the direct correlation of this subject at the start, you're going to find out that not only is this information necessary to know from this point forward, it's going to lead to a lot of interesting discussion, not only in this video, but further videos. But in order to do that, we need to know the basics of these stories and mythologies. Just like the previous video, I will be attempting to answer all of these questions that I have come across during my continued research on Remake and the compilation. And once again, I will be doing my best to give as much context to these findings as I discuss them. So, things will be broken down to the best of my knowledge in order to give you guys the perspective that I have developed over time. That being said, here we go. The Theory we who were born of the planet, with her we speak, her flesh we shape. Unto her promised land shall we one day return. By her loving grace and providence, may we take our place in paradise. We who are born of the planet are the Cetra. With her we speak, Minerva. Her flesh we shape, the summons. Unto her promised land shall we one day return, returning to the life stream by her loving grace and providence. Providence is defined by two things. One, God or nature as providing protective or spiritual care. Two, timely preparation for future eventualities. By Minerva's loving grace and her plan, a plan dictated to her by the life stream, may we take our place in paradise, Ragnarok, and the rebirth of the world. Every text in Final Fantasy VII depicts the events of time. The Cetra Tablet, Loveless, this ancient proverb, the depiction of the life stream, a repeating cycle as stated by Rufus and Advent Children, the calendar, the restart of 2000 years. But we are introduced to a new concept of this depiction of the life stream in Dirge. A depiction of the life stream as a circle. Shalua from Dirge of Cerberus says this. Mom said, everything in this world flows around in a circle. That means she'll come back someday. This depicts a ring of events. All of these examples show us that the world's events are doomed to repeat themselves. A plan, as the proverb states, is the plan of the physical representation of the planet, the god of nature. Final Fantasy VII, a world of cycling events with a power that makes up the very fabric of the universe. Fate and the souls of the planet is the same power that dictates this cycle. What if I told you the personification of this power, led by the idea of balance, has been controlling a large cycle from a time that we cannot even imagine, and that this cycle was overseen by its children, the Cetra, and that even though the party has disconnected itself from the threads of destiny, destiny cannot be altered, and that all of the things that we have feared, all of the worries of a beloved story changing for the worst was a trick, and that with or without the Harbinger, Final Fantasy VII Remake's events are destined to end the same way that they always have, and that the end of these events, the world was destined to burn, all to be reborn to repeat the cycle of events that it always has? What if I told you that the strings of destiny being pulled not only control all of the groups at play over time to lead towards this goal, but that Aerith, through the voices of the planet, 
is not just being tricked by Sephiroth in Final Fantasy VII Remake, but is actually a crucial piece, a puppet being guided by the same force that Aerith has tried to break away from. Just as Cloud is the puppet to Sephiroth, Aerith is the puppet to the planet. And even though Aerith seems to have escaped the prison of her destiny, that because of this, she is doomed to die the same way that she was always meant to, this video is going to break open the top of what you understand of Final Fantasy VII. All of the pieces coming to a head. I think that this particular video will delve into not only some information that will give some peace of mind to you guys, but will allow me to express some of my own feelings on what we can expect from the remake, and will also allow me to speak about some of the details of Final Fantasy VII that have been relatively hard to interpret up until now. What is the reasoning behind the depiction of both the Forgotten Capital and the Central Land depicted in Final Fantasy VII Remake? What is the point of the recurring events? What is it meant to lead to? What is the larger function of Minerva. There are eyes that glow brightly on characters. What is the point of this oddity? And so many more questions that come up in this video alone. The theory is that by looking at what mythology Final Fantasy VII is referencing, they are all events, characters, and other correlations that pertain directly to Final Fantasy VII and to Remake. Without further ado, this theory starts in a very unlikely place. You thought that the Pride and Joy was just a throwaway side boss just for the sake of a challenge, huh? Well, with every reference this boss makes, there is lore relevance to match it. Pride and Joy is a machine bearing remarkably similar ties to another boss from the original Final Fantasy VII called Proud Claude. But as we come to understand through the translation of the name Pride and Joy, Pride and Joy is hinting that this particular model fought in Final Fantasy VII Remake, Pride and Joy, is just the first incarnation of the boss Proud Claude, being mentioned as Proud Claude Unit Zero. They are the same thing. They are a part of the same line of models. Their connection has a deeper meaning to us though, as there are two important things that you receive upon defeating Pride and Joy. First, the trophy you receive upon defeating Pride and Joy, Ultimate Weapon, and that you receive a necklace. Let's talk about the first thing, the trophy. This reference to weapons through Pride and Joy is not a coincidence. The original game's Proud Claude also has a similar weapon association, carrying anti-weapon artillery. It was presumed before Remake that the machine was built to fight off any weapon that might have stepped foot in Midgar. I'm not entirely sure if this is the case now, now that we know of the existence of Pride and Joy, at least you would think so. Proud Claude now seems like a machine modified to fight weapons, rather than being directly built to fight them. From what we know about the existence of Pride and Joy, this machine was built from blueprints and made real in the VR training room meaning that there is no reason to develop a machine to fight the weapons at this particular time during its development. Because the weapons were a myth in the eyes of a lot of the people involved in the development of the machine. And when I mean people, I mean Scarlet. Being the head of development, Scarlet seems to bear zero knowledge of anything but the promised land, as described by President Shinra. Then again, we do see her developing huge materia in Remake. Perhaps she is more interested in the weapons than we know, and it is stated in the enemy description that it was discontinued as it was too dangerous. This could explain why later on in Final Fantasy VII we see a different incarnation of this design of Pride and Joy, because now there is a need for a much more dangerous machine in order to fight the weapons. The second thing. The second thing is very important to our main discussion, the necklace. Why is this item so important to what we need to know? To answer this, let's look back at Proud Claude. 
Proud Claude in the original Final Fantasy VII drops this weapon, Ragnarok, while Pride and Joy drops a necklace called Gatodamarong. You're gonna hear that pronunciation a lot. I don't even know if I'm able to do it correctly, but let's hope that that's it. Gatodamarong. These two things are directly linked to one source of Norse mythology, and although these two things are similar, they have deeper meaning than just their first connection. Norse mythology, as we will learn, gives us a lot of perspective on the potential for the future of Remake. These two items, especially the necklace, point to some pretty alarming stuff. Norse mythology. To give a bit of context to the relevance of Norse mythology to Final Fantasy VII, we will look at the original Final Fantasy VII. Picking a fun example of this is Nibelheim, Cloud's birthplace. Nibelheim is actually translated directly in Norse as being home of the clouds. Kind of crazy, huh? So what is Ragnarok and what is Gatadamarung? Gatadamarung item description reads, a necklace that radiates a light powerful enough to forge destiny anew. This item description, in my opinion, is meant to completely mislead you. It is a trick, and I love it. And we're going to learn exactly why by taking a look about what it directly references. Gata Damarang is known in English as the Twilight of the Gods. Gata Damarang is also a German translation of the word Ragnarok which also refers to the former English translation, but is also known as the Fate of the Gods. Yes, Ragnarok and Gatadamarung both have a direct link to the same thing in Norse mythology, the same event, but they have some key differences because of the language difference. So what is Ragnarok? Ragnarok is the prophesized war of all beings. This should already be sending red flags to you. It is the death of several notable characters in the mythology, including some of the creation gods. This event results in the world burning. The world is then submerged into water and then the world becomes anew again. This cycle repeats itself. There are a lot of details within depictions of this story that we're going to get into but let's discuss the general idea and how it can apply to the universe of Final Fantasy VII. One that we know of already is the planet's calendar system signifying a similar restart. And similarly, an event that brings about the world's end in Loveless, the War of Beast bringing about the world's end. And that, as I've speculated before, Loveless repeats this cycle, similar to Ragnarok. The event signifies a rebirth of the world after its destruction. And as we will come to find out, there is so much more relevance to this in Final Fantasy VII than just this connection. As Ragnarok is the general story depicted in many different ways, Gatadamarong is directly associated with the specific telling of events of Ragnarok. And the fact that it is a specific story is super important. Gata Damarung. Now, before I start speaking about this subject, I am going to be very clear so that there isn't any confusion. This story, Gata Damarung, takes a lot of liberties to the mythos of Norse mythology. It isn't a separate mythology per se, but there are a lot of things that you will only find in this story. Ideas and depictions of characters that are exclusive to it, which makes the use of the story as the name for a secret boss's item in Final Fantasy VII Remake way more interesting to me, as the usage of this mythos allows us to draw a lot of interesting parallels. The basics. Gata Damarung is better known as the last in a cycle of four music dramas called The Ring of Nibelung. The ring and its story signifies a cycle. This cycle, as we will come to understand it, is no different to that described by Shalua in Dirge of Cerberus with the life stream. This last part of the cycle and the last part of this story depicts the events that lead up to Ragnarok. This is how the story begins. The three Norns, powerful entities that represent the past, present, and future of the Norse mythology and daughters of the goddess Edra. They gather beside Brudenhilda's rock, weaving the rope of destiny or fate. They sing of the past, 
present, and future. Without warning, their rope breaks. Lamenting the loss of their wisdom, the norms disappear. Don't worry, I'm gonna break down this terminology and the characters depicted in detail. But without getting too far ahead of ourselves, here is what you need to know from the rest of this story. The Rope of Destiny in Norse mythology depicts Ragnarok. Breaking it does not cause it. The loss of wisdom that the Norns experience and the rope breaking does not stop the events that the Norns weave into fate from occurring. It just removes the knowledge that they possess. Importantly, the knowledge of past present and future. They just are no longer able to see what's coming next, and the events of Ragnarok, as they foretell, still plays out exactly the same. The other notable thing is that it's only in this story that the thread breaks. In other depictions of the story, the rope remains intact. The end of the world plays out exactly as it was destined to. Ragnarok takes place, and the world Burns, Gathadamarung, the Rope of Fate, the Norns, the Goddess Edra, Ragnarok, and its events are a direct parallel to Final Fantasy VII Remake. So similar that I think it actually tells us all we need to know. I'm going to break this down one by one. Before we go directly into this though, we need to understand one thing about the life stream. The life stream and knowledge. Mako, the modern term of the life stream's energy, is the thing that makes up everything in the universe, all of which is directly connected to the life stream itself. One aspect of the life stream is it is made up of not only the souls of all living things, it also is the presence of knowledge of all of those beings and the planet. This knowledge is what actually makes Mako poisonous. Those who have Mako poisoning are actually those who are overloaded with so much Mako that they are flooded with too much knowledge. This knowledge makes those who aren't grounded enough in a sense of who they are susceptible to being driven mad or become catatonic. This is one of the reasons why Zack is not affected by his bathing in Mako in Nibelheim, because he is someone who is grounded in who he is. Another example of this is Sephiroth from falling into the life stream, and the Sephiroth after. The Sephiroth before falling into the life stream believed he was a Cetra and that Genova was one as well, but after falling into the life stream, Sephiroth became flooded with the knowledge of the planet's life stream, learning the truth of his origins through this knowledge and begins to rebuild his body in the northern crater. This is an aside, but this is one of the things that makes Sephiroth so insanely dangerous. His power and his knowledge. The reason we need to know this is because the life stream has several associations in Final Fantasy VII that are depicted as having a direct correlation to Norse mythology. The life stream is depicted as having a connection to the Cetra, the water, knowledge, and fate. The life stream and the Cetra can communicate through nature itself in the form of flowers and water. This is all linked to the portrayal of water in Norse mythology and the portrayal of the Norns. The Rope of Fate. Fate being the thing that the Norns weave. They themselves are aware of these events and in the story of Gatadamarung sing about these events as they weave. This can be directly tied to Aerith's behavior in Remake, as she is able to see things that have yet to happen because of her association with the Cetra. The other thing that we learn from Gatadamarung is that once the rope of fate is broken, the Norns lose their knowledge and vanish. We see this echoed in Aerith's behavior as well. Once destiny is defeated, Aerith no longer possesses the knowledge of what is next. This is shown to us several times after the defeat of the Harbinger. Their water association comes from their connection to one specific thing, the Well of Fate Water. The Norns are usually depicted below the tree of Yggdrasil. Yggdrasil is known as the tree that connects the nine worlds of Norse mythology. It is the thing that holds the universe of Norse mythology together. Three roots of this tree extend to three different wells, the notable one for this discussion being the Well of Fate. The Well of Fate, found where the Norns reside, is used by the Norns as a way of strengthening the health of Yggdrasil through its roots. 
the eye of the god of knowledge lays at the bottom of the well. It is also noteworthy that this wisdom was so alluring and so vast that even Odin, also known as the Allfather, placed one of his own eyes into it in order to obtain the knowledge it possessed. By doing this, it granted him an incomprehensible amount of knowledge of the universe. Keep the eye in mind, as they also will play a significant role later in Final Fantasy VII in several notable places, because this well parallels Lucrezia's pool and dirge, the scene of this materia at the end of Final Fantasy VII underwater, and again where it comes to the eyes of other characters. From this, we can create a direct parallel, that fate, knowledge, and water are all part of the same concept that makes up the life stream and the well of fate. That in itself is pretty direct, but there's more. As I said before, the well of fate is located underneath Yggdrasil in an area near the roots. We see the same imagery depicted in the original Final Fantasy VII in the water altar in the forgotten capital, the water altar. In Final Fantasy VII, the water altar is an area below the surface of the earth, in an area that sits underneath a large, seemingly dead tree. This altar is where Aerith prays to activate Holy. There are also other depictions of this type of altar in another location with the Forgotten Capital. Once activating this altar, an image projected onto the water shows us images of things that our characters have not seen before. The location of the Holy Materia after it has been activated. The only reason that the party knows to activate this altar is because Bugenhagen picks up the voices of the souls of Setra in this area, and that they alert him of the crisis one of endless time. This is not a coincidence that this is being heard by Bugenhagen, because the same way that the voices of the Setra are communicating to Bugenhagen is exactly how Aerith herself comes across the knowledge of Holy. In Final Fantasy VII Ultimania, we learn this, that when an ancient learns of Holy in the Forgotten Capital, they are to pray at the Water Altar, and their mind then links to the planet. It is confirmed through the Ultimania that this is the way that Aerith learns of her materia's importance and how to activate it. Let us break this down by looking at this series of events that leads Aerith to the Forgotten Capital. Aerith, after speaking to Cloud in a dream sequence in Final Fantasy VII, we learn that Aerith has no knowledge as to why she needs to go to the Forgotten Capital. At this point in the story, the only thing that she knows is a feeling. This feeling that she is being called by something to the Forgotten Capital. She finds herself at this first water altar. Through this altar, just as Bugenhagen later, she gains the knowledge of the Setra. She learns about what she must do, and that in order to directly link to the planet to activate Holy, she needs to be at the water altar. This presence of knowledge from this first altar, and then the direct link to the planet from the other are both mirroring the nature of the wells in Norse mythology. To make things even more interesting, you should also understand that similarity to those in the world of Gaia. The Norse also would look to the planet for guidance in nature, animals, birds, the sky, the water, believing that by observing these things that they could possess the divine answers to their questions. Hmm, the way that nature works for Cetra in Final Fantasy VII is no different. From the examples above and from previous points in other videos, we know that flowers and water, Cetra link themselves to the planet. We are seeing the same depiction of this in the water altar, that Cetra, through the ability they possess, planet reading, are linking themselves to the knowledge of the planet when connecting to nature, and by doing this, they are able to see future events, past events, and even start world-changing events 
through this connection. The connection to the life stream is linking yourself to the structure of fate, time, and the fabric of life itself, the knowledge of the planet. This moves into our next talking point. What exactly does the activation of Holy do? And what is the significance of its counterpart, Meteor? How do these things play into our study of Norse mythology? The function of Holy Ragnarok. How exactly Holy applies its power, once invoked and in operation, is not definite. It is simply known that all that is bad for the planet will disappear. I am of the opinion that these two abilities, Holy and Meteor, are the catalyst for the equivalent of Ragnarok, for the world ending, and that because of this, both Meteor and Holy are both relatively bad for mankind. But one is worse. Let us look very quickly at how Ragnarok goes down. The world burns, the world is submerged, and then it is created anew. This theme plays throughout all events of Final Fantasy VII compilation. Zirconiad, a summon meant to bring about the world's destruction, is to burn everything to the ground. An event similar to Meteor is depicted in Dirge of Cerberus, the planet being hit by meteors and engulfed in flames. But Meteor, as we know it, upon hitting the planet, will invoke the life stream, which will inevitably leave it open for Sephiroth to absorb. We know that the intention of this is so that Sephiroth can rule the planet. I thought this was just a fun thing to add, but there is some cut dialogue from the original game right before you fight Sephiroth in the final battle. Dialogue from that game that has just been cut out gives us a slightly better insight into what that Sephiroth's goal is over. It is over. Everything. Everyone. Everything. It is all over. Now, everything will begin with me. We're going to get back to this depiction of how things go down, particularly in this last part of Final Fantasy VII uh, with Safer Sephiroth, in a different section of this discussion. Holy is meant to stop Meteor, but the implication of Holy is that it wipes the slate clean, so to speak. It ends whatever the planet deems as being bad, which as we learn in Final Fantasy VII that humanity might be a part of that bad, meaning that after its activation, all of humanity could simply be eliminated. This might be the reason that there isn't humanity at the end of Final Fantasy VII. There are other very strange, very ominous depictions of this event, Ragnarok, that may have already taken place before on the planet Gaia, a prior Ragnarok. One of the biggest things that has always stuck out to me was the way that the Cetra landscapes were always depicted. They all have this water theme, seashell houses, coral-like trees, seahorse enemies. This is all a direct association with water to the Cetra as we've discussed before, but this also hints at something different, a land that was once submerged in water. In Norse mythology, a direct connection to the events right after the destruction of the Earth, the world is submerged in water, and from this action, the land becomes rich and fertile. In the VR cutscene in Remake, we see a lot of ruins. We see it in the opening before we get to the tree. Even the main hub of the Cetra, where we see the materia being made, is growing out of another building. This all seems very odd to depict the Cetra in this way. One part of their civilization seemingly used to be underwater, and one built off of the ruins of another civilization. One from the original game, and one from the new. Why would they show us this? To tell us that the cycle of the destruction of the planet has happened already. Much like what we have discussed in other parts, Loveless, the calendar, and all of its points to a cycle of world-ending events, and that these cycles repeat. What we are seeing in the VR segment is that life grew over the ruins of something that was already there, most likely to serve as a way of exploring the idea that maybe their origins of being the stewards of the planet isn't as simple as we think. We see this in the area of the water altar as well, an altar that sits in a city that is unlike anything that we have seen depicted in Final Fantasy VII before. A more advanced civilization 
than the one depicted on the surface of the Forgotten Capital. I have a theory on this, and with that comes some things that I personally find interesting. Summons. Someone in the comments asked me about what I thought about summons in Final Fantasy VII Remake, as we know now that their function in Remake seems to be greater to the overall plot of the game. Shiva being depicted as an entity that helped heal slash encase the planet's wounds in ice. This is something that we understood in Final Fantasy VII as the planet gathering the life stream to heal the wound of the planet. Because of this focused effort, the area around the northern crater became desolate of life, an icy tundra. Shiva's involvement in this event is not necessarily a retcon of that, but rather gives us reason as to the snow in the areas around the crater, as evidenced by the existence of permafrost in the polar lands. The depictions of summons in the VR cutscene in Remake summons were used by the Cetra, as the materia that flies out of the Cetra's hand in the cutscene moves into the forest, materializing the summons. From that, we can see that they were used in a way to carry out the will of the Cetra, and by osmosis, the planet. We also see this depiction in the painting that Aerith makes. The summons are being used by the Cetra to defend the planet. There is so much that I want to talk about with this painting, but I'm going to wait to go into those details. Some of the massive implications of this painting are going to be towards the end of the video. I don't have a lot to say about the summons, but don't think that I won't make an important mention of the rest of their function as I understand it. Ifrit. His description contributes to the function of Ragnarok, as we have talked about before, a powerful Dijin with control over scorching flames, hot enough to turn the whole world to ashes. This depiction of this summon simply reinforces what we already know about Ragnarok. The mention of the world being set ablaze here seems to be similar foreshadowing to this event. Now I want to take a step into the realm of speculation for a second. There is one other notable summon that I want to talk about. One that is not featured in Remake as we know of, but I think might be there. And I use the word might. I'm not saying that this summon is actually here, but there are some things that I really want to point out because I think that this idea is super exciting. <laughs> Alexander. In the Cetra's area, there is an odd difference in its depiction than anything else that we've ever seen the Cetra areas depict. There are eight pillars that seemingly make up the surrounding area, the ruins of the building that make up the base of the capital, and two pillars extending out from the top. These pillars are all laid out rather specifically. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video is, is that the eight pillars that make up the area around the Cetra area also line up perfectly with the Mako reactors in Midgar. Not only does this depict a cycling of events, of the destruction and then the rebirth of the world, I thought that Alexander could serve a function here as well, and are not featured in the original game. And this just got me thinking, why? This would be the perfect place to include the Summon Alexander, and its presence here would be perfectly explained. The 10 points in this wide shot very easily match the 10 points on top of the original design of Alexander in Final Fantasy VII. These buildings depicted are also similar to the nature of the ones that we see in the area where the water altar is. These buildings that make up this area are not worn like the ones that we see on the surface, rather they are untouched, protected below below the surface. Alexander has had many different variations and purposes in Final Fantasy since Final Fantasy VII, but this summon, for the majority of its depictions, acts as a way of defending cities, that and one being a city itself, or in later depictions, transporting things through time. There are a slew of other functions to this summon, but with just those two, make Alexander a prime candidate for what we have been seeing reoccur over all of the events of Remake in the original Final Fantasy VII. One of them being that it itself is a structure that holds inside of it 
cities. One of the things that kind of becomes clear through the events of Norse mythology is, is that the only safe place to reside during Ragnarok is inside of the tree, Yggdrasil. And if that's the case, why not just make that connection through Alexander? And since the buildings in the VR cutscene resembles the main building in the Forgotten Capital, Alexander's function would perfectly explain exactly how the Setra could survive into these different cycles of the planet specifically. Note that what I'm saying is only speculation, there isn't any more evidence to this. This is just something that I stumbled upon and thought was interesting and I thought it would be fun to share with you guys. This is not like a, this is not a Rufus thing. With our understanding that the summons are linked to specific events and the functions of the planet, I thought that Alexander's function would perfectly fit the role of preserving those inside of it. That all being said, we are still not done with our exploration into mythology, as we have one other character in Final Fantasy VII that has a direct reference to mythology, and a similar function in Norse mythology, which leads into talking about one of my favorite characters to talk about in the Final Fantasy VII franchise. But let's talk about the direct name association first. I have time and time again come across Minerva and each time I have, she has given far more relevance to the events in these stories. I think that Minerva plays a more crucial role in this than I ever could have imagined. You might think that I fixate on this character, but man, there's not every, I'm not covering everything that I've found about her in this video, but man, this isn't even the half of it, and it's all very relevant. Intro. We're gonna be taking a really large dive into Roman mythology. You need to understand the basics of this in order to get a better idea as to what exactly Minerva's function is in Final Fantasy VII, because a lot of this comes back to what we are seeing directly in Minerva's actions. But keep in mind all of what we have talked about with Norse mythology, because it will have direct relevance to what we are talking about here. First, let's look at the relevance of Minerva in respect to her name's origin. Minerva is a Roman goddess. You might be more familiar with her Greek goddess counterpart, Athena. What is the goddess associated with? Weaving. Weaving in Roman culture and weaving in Greek culture can be seen as an analogy for the course of fate, the threads of it, if you will. This is depicted similarly in the story of the ring, Gatadamarang, wisdom as an association that can be directly linked to the life stream, medicine, which you could interpret this medicinal side as being able to cure the affliction of Genesis. But the one thing that bugs me about this particular note is that Minerva, the goddess, is not usually associated with medicine. I only found one source to say that she does, so these other connections could just very well be a coincidence, but I thought that they were important to note. Strategy. Note that she is not the god depicted as one being one of violence, but one that instead represents more thoughtful, strategic, and defensive actions. We can see this type of behavior in the life stream itself, not acting, but more reactionary. A threat happens, and the planet responds. Her actions are not against violence, but rather that it is not the answer to every problem. The final representation of her is my favorite, because it describes what I think her function is in Final Fantasy VII perfectly, and will give us more insight on what her concept in Final Fantasy might be. Marcus Terentius Vero, a philosopher, considered her to be the ideas and the plan of the universe personified. If that doesn't lead into what we're about to talk about, I don't know what does. We know directly from developers that she acts as the will of the life stream, and as my other evidence on Minerva will support, the plan personified as described here. We are going to talk about that way more when we talk about Dirge of Cerberus. But that's not all. There is another depiction of a goddess that has a similar depiction to Minerva in Norse mythology. She also bears a similar power, and has direct relevance to the story Gatodamarang, the goddess Edra. Like I said at the beginning of talking about Gatodamarang, 
Certain characters are portrayed in different ways as they usually are. Edra has virtually zero presence in any Norse mythology material, as her presence was made rather late in the mythology. When Edra is depicted, she is not presented as the mother of the Norns and doesn't serve a significant role. But in Gotadamarung, that is very much not the case. She holds a place of extreme significance. What we do know of Edra is that she is known in this depiction of Norse mythology as being the physical representation of Mother Earth, the goddess of the Earth. A goddess that has a specific notable relation to be able to manipulate the powers of fate. She is also, as described before, directly associated with the Norns, being the mother of the three Norns who weave the rope of fate creating a similar connection to the origin of Minerva's name. She is Mother Earth personified and able to dictate the will of fate, the ideas and the plan of the universe personified. The roots of Yggdrasil were the threads that connected all life and were maintained directly by her children, the Norns, who we have already drawn a familiarity with the Cetra, those who are born with a connection to the planet. The gift of wisdom through the well that she is associated with, the well of fate, strengthens Yggdrasil, allowing for its branches to stretch farther into the heavens. Edra was also often associated with the art of denovation because of her connection to knowledge. These are practitioners of the divine. Edra and her daughters were associated with this quote, they together ruled over a person's unchangeable fate. In the proverb, as we have previously discussed, mentioned her loving grace and providence. Providence, mother nature, the god of nature, the physical embodiment of a plan. Is Minerva the physical embodiment of the life stream? A goddess that dictates the fate of life itself. This leads into our last subject of this video. They say. Good work today, guys. Kidding. They didn't say a word. But you know, it won't be much longer now. The flowers, they they have something important to tell us. Something they need to share with us. At least that's the feeling I get. But before they can there's a final step that has to be taken. Otherwise, we won't hear them. Follow them, the yellow flowers. Aerith is not saying this. She is quoting something someone else said. This line has been bugging me ever since I read it. But now, with all the things that we've talked about, I believe very strongly that Minerva is the one telling Aerith to let the flowers guide her. Let me explain. There is one particular text that I have yet to be able to talk about. This text, written by Nojima, was released before Remake and has a direct correlation with the story of Remake, and it explains some very key information that we have to know. Final Fantasy VII Remake, a world preview, contains a short story where we learn about one valuable piece of information. One, we learn that Aerith created the painting on her wall in Remake, not her mother, not anyone else, Aerith, and that there was an interest in Aerith doing this painting by Hojo and by President Shinra because this painting was thought of by them to be a depiction of where the promised land might be, and that they were waiting to see if Aerith would be able to, after an awakening, depict exactly where it was. And from what we know of the painting ourselves, it is quite accurate to events that we know of. But that isn't even the coolest part, too. Aerith has no real knowledge as to how she was able to do this or what she is seeing. She is just a child. What allows her to depict the Cetra, the summons, and the calamity are visions. The story does not explain 
where these visions come from, only that she is experiencing these visions and that she seems possessed, and that this picture on the wall is not the first time that she has done this. In an earlier part of the story, Aerith's childhood friend and her are in her room. The kid tries to draw a picture of a monster. Aerith then seizes control of the drawing and turns the image black with her scribbles. Aerith fixed her eyes on the drawing enthusiastically. I got a shock from Aerith's reaction. After that, roar! <laughs> she growled as though she was like a beast. She grabbed a hold of the pen and started drawing something ferociously. She forcefully drew onto the paper a distorted face of a person, tree, flower, animal, and maybe a monster. Because she repeatedly drew one after another, the paper very quickly turned pitch black. Professor Hojo finally arrived. Aerith also did not notice, even when he came close to peer into the drawing. She is drawing as though she is possessed by something. Aerith, Professor Hojo called out. Do you see anything? Aerith nodded. I can see it. I can hear it. Aerith. Finally, you have awakened. This depiction is that of a vision. Interestingly enough, seems to be one that Aerith cannot control. We can elaborate on this. Aerith mentions in the scene in her room in Final Fantasy VII Remake that she couldn't lead Shinra to the Promised Land, even if she tried. This is signifying to us that there was never any control that Aerith had over her drawings, and really, she has no control over the visions. The mention of an awakening that Hojo mentions means that most likely her awakening as a Cetra, and that somehow, in this moment, Aerith is able to see visions given to her by something. The voices of the planet, the life stream, these visions that possess her resemble the ones that guide Aerith later in the original Final Fantasy VII, where she feels that she is being drawn to the Forgotten Capital, but not told why. But through being guided to the First Altar, she then gains the knowledge of Holy. In both situations, Aerith is given this information. Information she did not yet have access to up until this point. These points are revealed to her only when she needs to know about them. But unlike Bugenhagen with the depiction of the altar later, Aerith isn't tapping into that connection before. Rather, a connection is being made by something else to her to give her the knowledge. To further illustrate this lack of control that Aerith has, we go back to the short story. After a thin and exhausted Aerith has finished the painting that we see on the wall, the President and Hojo are unsatisfied, because what they wanted wasn't this vision that seemingly depicts the past, but the location of the promised land. So they continue to force her. When we see Aerith next, Hojo removes Aerith's mother from her room, and she is told by Hojo that she won't see her mother again, and that if she doesn't paint, the landscape to show them the promised land, people will die. I can't paint, so why not give up? I want to see my mother. I want to see her. If it's not the actual landscape, someone will die. The professor said so. Just a side note, do you see how well all of this then becomes translated to Hojo's relationship with Aerith and how that is shaped so much? of who she is. This gives us a very good reason to show us why Aerith is so patient and so collected. She has been dealing with this psycho <laughs> since she was a child. The reason she is able to be focused when Hojo is getting off on the idea that he has her mother's dead cells just illustrates how much she has had to do for herself to keep herself sane over the years. This is just good characterization. Even after all of these threats by Hojo and the president, Aerith tells him that she can no longer see anything and instead fakes a picture with the help of her friend. This is an important note, even in this dire situation, she can't see anything. That's because she isn't really the one in control of the visions. Something else is. 
Aerith desperately wanted her mother back and never wanted to give up but couldn't produce anything that was any use to her situation. Even the faked drawing proves to be worthless, so these visions aren't coming from some unconscious place. Conclusion We who are born of the planet, the Cetra, with her we speak, her flesh we shape. Aerith is speaking to Minerva. Her visions shaped through Aerith's actions. So what do you think comes into view then when this scene happens. Follow them, the yellow flowers. This voice directly mirrors that of the short story. Aerith can hear things and see things. This is the first time a specific voice is quoted from the planet. I am not saying she hears this in this moment that she says this, but I think Aerith has been following this mantra for quite some time. The reason that this scene after this is the depiction of the flower falling apart, because Aerith in this scene is losing hope, and she is losing her trust in the path mentioned to her. Her loss of faith in the system that has guided her. If I had to take a guess, from what we have talked about from Norse mythology and exactly how the function of Norns are and what their mother represents, a being that can manipulate fate and alter its course, yes, the Norns seem to possess this ability to see fate as well, but unlike their mother, the planet, it is able to decide the events for itself. And rather than the Norns just being those who are in control, they are more to serve a cog in a greater plan. Aerith fits perfectly to be serving as the same function as the Norn, a cog, a function for Minerva. In the same way that Sephiroth can control Cloud, Minerva is using Aerith. Cloud and Aerith are both puppets that belong to these separate entities. And from what we know of the depiction of Minerva in Roman mythology, all there is for her to do is wait, to plan, to weave, to dictate those who we have perceived to be the ones in control. And her connection to Minerva by means of function, I'm going to bet this is the live stream personified Minerva who is telling Aerith to follow the yellow flowers. She is telling her that she needs to stay on course. Why? She is guiding Aerith to incite the events that will protect the planet, but also bring about the end of humanity, the end of the cycle to restart it. Aerith, although a powerful Cetra, is being used by the planet in order to get what it wants, the cycle to end, and the birth of a new to begin. So what can I say at the end of all this that sums up this entire deconstruction? Looking back on the item description, knowing what we now know of the story that it references, a necklace that radiates a light powerful enough to forge destiny anew. A light powerful enough could very well be the flames of a world burning. Remake's story sets up for you to think that things can change, that destiny is no longer written, that it is a blank page, just like Loveless, and that because of this, things can change to forge destiny anew. But the story that this necklace refers to depicts a similar hope, but that in the end, what is destined to happen takes place. The story tells us directly that no matter what has happened to destiny, that the cycle of events will still play out, and that this too was something that was already foreseen. What so many of us who have played Final Fantasy VII Remake have been afraid of all along is Remake changing the story. And to me, personally, I don't think that's the case at all. Of course the compilation is relevant, and I think that it will play a part in the story, but the events of Final Fantasy VII will all play out the same. If anything, they will just be more enhanced, and that what is coming at the end of the story is 
the burning of a old world and the birth of a new. Now at this point, you are probably thinking that I'm wrong and that these connections to the mythology isn't going to be enough to be convincing. And we're not done with this subject, not even close. The Eye of Odin placed in the bottom of the Well of Fate, unlocking an incomprehensible amount of knowledge of the universe. A god with a single eye. A god with a special eye. Genesis, Genova, Sefer Sephiroth, the Proto-Materia, the Materia scene at the end of Final Fantasy VII, and Minerva, and Deep Ground, all of these creatures, these events, possess a representation of the event in Norse mythology. What do these eyes mean to us? What does that mean for the eventual outcome of the remake? So what have we learned in this video? We learned that Final Fantasy VII Remake and probably the original seems to have been heavily inspired by the events of Norse mythology, its cycle, its depiction of destiny and fate, and its cataclysmic events that represents the death of the old world and the birth of a new are all mirrored in one way or another in its story. We learned that Minerva, the physical manifestation of the life stream, could very well be dictating the events and using her power of fate has been using Aerith as a puppet for quite some time. And that my mythology reunion theory and my Minerva theory will all come together. For those who um, just wanted to watch the theory video, uh, that's done. So just giving you a heads up that from here on out, I'm just gonna be talking. Stick around if you want. I know that you guys are probably thinking that this video was gonna be a lot more of what I set up in part two, uh, but I felt that I needed to address these connections to give us some more interesting context for what those subjects kind of present. Genova, Loveless, uh, most of the information provided in this video will actually be a massive help to us moving forward. More context just means more things that we can talk about, uh, and we can talk about these elements more openly in the future without having to explain them in as much detail as this video has gone into. I would like to mention some people directly, mainly Obsidian. Uh, thank you for your help with the mythology. You are a pro researcher and way more dedicated to Final Fantasy than I am, and you've helped me understand a massive amount of Norse mythology and Final Fantasy, uh, and I can't thank you enough. And to everyone in the live stream, and you guys, thank you. All of you have helped me stay inspired, stay motivated, and helped me out in a lot of ways, and I never expected uh, to have such an awesome reception uh, from all of you who are watching this. Uh, we were really close to hitting 1,000 subs at the time of this video, and I never really expected this channel to get anywhere close to this far, this fast, and I just wanted to, once again, personally, thank you all. You guys have been so awesome to talk to in the comments, and I will continue to try my best to get to each and every one of you guys. When these videos start being made though, it's hard to kind of balance my time um, between them. But just know that no matter what you ask or when you ask it, I will, I will try my best to get to that stuff. Um, and I think that it's super important that you guys are so invested in this like I am. And I want to be able to reciprocate that. Um, yeah, so thank you so much to my subs. Thank you so much to my subscribers. And just anybody who took the time to watch this, I really can't thank you enough. And for those who are wondering about part four, I've finished the research of that video pretty much. Um, so I'm going to start it at, as soon as this is up. Um, so you won't have to wait long. I know that this episode wasn't as long as part two. Um, just know that another one will be coming soon. So I will see you guys all in part two. Mm-hmm.